An excerpt from To Hell and Regroup, book three of the 18th Race Trilogy, by David Sherman and Keith R.A. DeCandido. Battleship NAUS Durango, in geosync orbit around the semi-autonomous world Troy. Captain Harry M.P. Hughes felt headache number four coming on. Ever since he'd taken command of Durango, Hughes had started classifying his headaches. Number one usually came on when he had to deal with the brass, and was the one that felt like a needle was being driven through the bridge of his nose. While number two was the throbbing in his temples that generally accompanied an argument with his husband. He hadn't had number three in years. That ache in his forehead only showed when he had to bring an underling up on charges, and he hadn't had any underlings that fucked up in either of his last two postings. The Durango crew in particular had been exemplary, even now against as brutal an enemy as the human race had ever faced. As for number four, that was a sharp pain behind the eyes that characterized reading a report he didn't like. This particular report from was, was from his chief intel officer, Lieutenant Commander McCleary, which stated that this was the first time in 18 engagements that the Dusters had whipped out tanks, as there was no evidence of any kind of large ground vehicle on the other 17 worlds. Hughes was reading her report in advance of the Lieutenant Commander herself reporting along with his XO, Commander Intema. Just as he got to the end of it, the comms rang out with the voice of his adjutant, Lieutenant Rufus King Jr. Sir, the XO and the CIO are here as ordered. Send him in. The two officers entered. Hughes waved his right hand in the direction of the guest chair. He was grateful that Navy tradition was that you only saluted a senior officer once per day, and then only in duty areas. You didn't salute inside. Of course, a spaceship was entirely inside, but the, for these purposes, an office counted as inside. For his part, Hughes didn't even like the daily saluting. And in fact, he'd been written up more than once for violating protocol by not saluting properly or at all. Everyone on Durango knew the hierarchy. As long as they paid attention to their superiors, Hughes didn't give a shit if they put their hands to their foreheads. It was like an oath of office. You only needed to swear it the once. Intema and McCleary sat down in the guest chairs as requested. Sir, Intema said, I'm afraid Commander McCleary has a new report. I don't need another headache, Gordon. None of us do, sir, but we've got one. Hughes looked at the intel officer. Go ahead. McCleary cleared her throat, glanced at Intema, who nodded, and then said, Sir, we've got confirmation that the Dusters are taking positions surrounding firebases Westermark, Gasson, and Cart. Surrounding? Yes, sir. All the way around? Yes, sir. Hughes frowned. On purpose? Looks like, sir, McCleary said. They've moved into position completely surrounding each firebase. Calling the report up on his screen, Hughes stared at the report, which showed the images they'd taken from orbit. I'm not buying it, Hughes finally said. Sir? McCleary asked, confused. Oh, I believe your report, the captain said quickly. But I'm not buying that the dusters are this stupid. They've been tactically sound up until now. Why suddenly go all stupid on us? McCleary said, If I may, sir? Hughes made a go-ahead gesture. This may relate to my original report about the ground vehicles. This may be new territory for them. After all, this is the first time in 18 engagements that they've had to whip out the big gun. Maybe they're in tactically unfamiliar territory. Maybe. Hughes stared at the report some more. Then he got to his feet. The two junior officers did likewise. Either way, we gotta run this up the ladder so they can run it down to the surface. But we can't just assume the enemy is stupid. Nobody ever won a war assuming that. Then he smiled. <laughs> Having said that, lots of people have won wars because the enemy is stupid, but that's for the enemy to deal with. We just need to fight them. Yes, sir. Rufus! King stuck his head into Hughes's office. Sir? Tell Admiral Avery I need to talk to him ASAP. Yes, sir. You two are dismissed. 
Reports every 15 from Intel. Aye, aye, sir, McCleary said. A few minutes later, after Intema and McCleary had returned to their stations, King made a slight yelping sound. Frowning, Hughes got up and went to the doorway to his office, only to see King standing at attention and Admiral Avery himself approaching. At ease, Lieutenant, Avery said. King shifted to parade rest. Sir, I would have come to you, Hughes said. I need to stretch my legs, Avery said. What's the poop? They both entered the office, and Hughes filled him in on both reports he'd gotten from McCleary. They've been getting reports from the ground that indicate the same thing. Good to get confirmation up here. Avery rubbed his jaw. Interesting about the ground vehicles, but I don't see that that matters much in the here and now. Agreed, sir, but it does show a pattern, as Intel indicated. The dusters may be in uncharted waters. That just may mean they'll fight harder. Then again, surrounding our marines and soldiers down there may mean the same thing. Yes, sir. Avery got up from the guest chair and said, Good work, Harry. Hughes rose and nodded. Thank you, Admiral. Turning toward the door, Avery said, Tell King to contact Davis and have him be ready to send a squib to the surface. Aye, aye, sir. Camp Zion, near Jordan, western Shapland, on the semi-autonomous world of Troy. Say what? Corporal John Mackey yelped when he heard the Navy intelligence report. Are they out of the F-11 mines? They're aliens, Mackey, S Sergeant James Martin, his squad leader, said patiently. Who knows what that goes on in their minds? I sure don't. And if anybody higher higher knows, they aren't telling me. Mackey shook his head and looked at the men in his fire team. They were staring at him and Martin as though the two were crazy. Or, at least like the Navy intel report was. We're Marines, Martin said. When we're surrounded, all that means is we get to shoot in all directions. He left, headed for the platoon CP bunker. He hadn't said it, but he agreed with Mackey. The aliens had to be out of their fucking minds. Mackey glared at his men. You heard Sergeant Martin? He said, all this means is we get to shoot in all directions. He shook his head in disgust. Crazy fucking aliens, he muttered. Lance Corporal Caffer Cafferata shook his head as he checked his weapon. That's just nuts. I mean, completely surrounded in a defensive position like that, they're all set up for a circular firing squad. Not if they hit us in front of them instead of their own people behind us, Or Orndorff said. Horton shrugged. We could duck. Damn right, Cafferato laughed and slapped the new PFC on the back. And we come up shooting. Got nowhere to go anyhow since we're surrounded, so we fight those dusters even harder. All right, people, let's get ready to rumble, Mackey said. Sound off, 313. Here, Cafferato said. Present, said Orndorff. Horton just said, yo, let's move out. As they marched to position, Horton muttered to Orndorff, you know what I don't get? Probably a lot, Orndorff said. Orndorff said. Horton snorted. Don't the dusters realize that we'd set up the fire bases to have mutually supporting fire? We should be able to hit the ones around Gasson from behind, from Cart and Westermark. Pretty sure that's why Mackey said fucking aliens, Orndorff said. Can of whispering, Mackey said. Double time! Horton, take point! They moved toward the firebase, having to reposition themselves since they were prepared for a frontal assault, not a weird-ass siege. Horton was still the rookie in the squad, so he took point. He moved to take cover in one tree. Then Ordnoff moved ahead while Horton covered him. Then Cafferata moved past them both while they covered him, with Mackey the last to progress from the squad. Each squad moved in the same formation, taking cover behind trees or rocks or bushes, depending on what the terrain provided. For some reason, Horton's mind went to his best friend, Fred Fisterer. They had grown up together in Regina, Saskatchewan, living next door to each other. They went to school together, enlisted together, went through boot camp together. But once they survived boot, they got assigned to different units. Fred was sent off to a base in Europe, specifically an air base in Budapest. Horton got sent to India Company, who got sent to this godforsaken planet that had been overrun by aliens who had really dumb strategies. 
What you gonna do, Hortman said when Fred apologized for his billet. We dance when they tell us. No big deal. Send me a postcard from Troy, was the last thing Fred had said to him. The last thing he'd said back was, the mail don't come that far. Mackie having moved to the front, it was back to Horton. Went past his squad mates and took point once again. As he did so, something caught Horton's eye as he once again moved forward, taking point. Holding up a fist, he stopped moving and then looked down. Activating his local comms for the squad, he said, Tripwire. Mackie nodded. 313, hold position. Horton, check it out. Shouldering his rifle around to his back, Horton knelt down and examined the tripwire. Slowly moving to his left, he tracked it visually, being careful not to touch anything, finally finding a small device. What you got, Horton? Mackie asked. Could be a paperweight for all I can tell you, Corporal, but I'd bet real money that it's an explosive. Mackie immediately activated company comms. India Company, be advised, 313 found a booby trap. Repeat, 313 found a booby trap. Eyes wide, everyone. All the other squads acknowledged in short order. Then a voice screamed, Shit! Back off, back off! An explosion shook the ground, and everyone stood at the ready with their rifles. Voices screamed over comms. Cayenne's down! Very nice, move, come on, move! Carmen! Sergeant Martin's voice bigfooted everyone. Three, two, one down, tripwire tripped. Everyone, stay frosty. We're going to be up to our ass in dusters in a minute. Confirm, Top, came the voice of Corporal, Corporal Mossard. We got movement bearing right on us. This is it, India Company. Stay frosty. Hoorah! Around Horton, everyone cried out, Hoorah! But Horton himself couldn't bring himself to say it. He'd only been with the squad a short time, having replaced PFC Zion. He wanted to fit in with the other guys to become part of the group. At least I found the tripwire, he thought, as he aimed his weapon, waiting for the dusters to come in sight. Here they come! Horton heard them first. The sound of several dozen dusters jinking back and forth, the dirt and brush being kicked up by their movement. And then they broke through, firing away. Taking aim, Horton shot at them from behind his tree. At that point, training took over. There were no thoughts of fitting in with the squad, of filling Zion's shoes, of his family back in Regina, or of Fred Fistrover. No. All he thought about now was the imperative of shooting dusters and not getting shot by them. His weapon became an extension of his own arm at that point. Aim, shoot. Aim, shoot. Three dusters went down from his weapon's fire, and three more were obviously wounded. Aim, shoot. He heard a scream behind him that sounded a lot like Ordnoff, but he wouldn't take his eye off the dusters as more of them were coming, and he had to keep shooting. A dozen of them were headed right for him. There had been two score of them, but the other 18 were taken down. But those dozen kept coming, and Horton was out of ammo. Shit. The dusters kept firing. Horton huddled behind the tree to reload his weapon, as the time that, that was taking would bring them even closer. He also saw that Ordnoff wasn't the only one who went down. He was just the only one who had time to scream. Mackie, Kafarada, and Ordnoff were all bleeding on the ground, and it didn't look like any of them were breathing. His weapon reloaded. He fired at much closer range now, but to much less effect. Aim. Shoot. One of the duster's weapons got his arm, pain slicing through his bicep. Eyes tearing, he blinked them away and kept firing. Aim. Shoot. They were almost on top of him now, and he couldn't take them all out himself. Or could he? Looking down, he saw the tripwire that he'd spotted, the very booby trap that the dusters had so poorly lain for them. There were a mess of them, but only one went off. And he went for two? The dusters were almost on top of him now, and there was no way he was going to survive. So he kicked the tripwire. The world exploded, and Horton's last thought was he was the glad that Fred, at least, would survive, even if he never did send that postcard. That is an excerpt from To Hell and Regroup by David Sherman and Keith R.A. DeCandido, on sale soon from the fine folks at eSpec Books. Thank you.